fire is our grandfather. It served as a central light, sending forth many blessings and lessons. The campfire is a sacred place to pass on the teachings of our elders. See in the fire the values of our ways and pride. You are an ancestor of the Anishinaabe, the original people. Do honor to your people. Respect all people and the earth. Remember to respect yourself and the knowledge and goodness that come from your rich heritage. Grow up strong and contribute abundantly to your extended family of brothers and sisters. Pass on that which you determine to be good and truthful. I have seen many changes in my life as Indian people who will continue to survive and evolve. It is my hope that you and future generations will continue to pass on our values. This is our way of life. Wisconsin, a village lies beneath 25 feet of dark water, a village whose spirits still speak to the many sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, and grandchildren of its original inhabitants who call this place home for more than two centuries. They named this village Pakwewong. It meant where the river is wide. The Lakuta Ray Reservation is located in an area of Wisconsin where scenic images of undisturbed nature still dominate the layout of the land. The setting is a diverse mixture of great pine forests, hardwoods, and wetlands. Wildlife is more abundant here than in perhaps any other part of the state. Bear, deer, heron, fisher, pine marten, bald eagle, and even elk are now seen with some degree of regularity. The pristine surroundings of the Chippewa flowage make this region a well-recognized ecological treasure that is blessed with extraordinary scenery along its more than 200 miles of undeveloped shoreline. The flowage is also known for its world-class fishing and hunting and abundant recreational activities that are available to outdoor enthusiasts. It is also home to the Lakuta Ray Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. This land they call home is actually a reservation. It is approximately 70,000 acres in size. The Lakuta Ray Reservation is bordered by the vast Shawamagan National Forest. Tribal enrollment is nearly 6,000 members. More than half of those members live here on the reservation. In many ways, the Lakuta Ray people enjoy a lifestyle very similar to most non-Indian people. However, in varying degrees, most choose to hold on to significant aspects of their heritage, culture, and traditions. They continue to practice traditional subsistence by hunting, fishing, and gathering throughout the four seasons. They work, go to school, pay taxes, enjoy recreational activities, and struggle to make things better for their children and their elders. They also desire for non-Indians to consider the injustice that results from preserving inappropriate and hurtful stereotypes and misconceptions about Native American people. They welcome non-native visitors to learn more about their way of life and to share the meaningful traditions that are a vital part of their culture, their beliefs, and their identity. The migration to the Great Lakes region for the Anishinaabe, or original people, began in the eastern woodlands of the North American continent hundreds of years before the arrival of the first European explorers. The great journey ended when the Anishinaabe reached Gichigumi, the big water, Lake Superior. The Lakuta Ray Band is just one of six bands of Chippewa, or more correctly, Ojibwe Indians, whose reservations are located within Wisconsin's state borders. There are also several other bands of Ojibwe Indians in neighboring Michigan and Minnesota, as well as in Canada. The Ojibwe enjoyed their traditional way of life and the bountiful harvest that the earth brought forth. Prayers and thanks were always given to the Creator for the nourishment provided to them. 
The Larkudere tribe moved from one part of their home range to another, taking advantage of the seasonal offerings. For centuries, they occupied a vast territory within a hundred mile radius of today's reservation. The name Lacoudere was given to the Indians in the area by early French explorers. Translated, it means Lake of the Short Ears or Lake of the Little Ears. Several explanations exist for the name. The most commonly accepted is that the early explorers noticed the Indians here had smaller earlobes than other Indians in the region. That might be because their ears were not weighted down with heavy earrings like other bands in the area. Another story suggests that the little ears represent the corn that was cultivated in the region. The size of the ears of corn grown here was stunted due to the area's shorter growing season. The Lacoudere formed several villages throughout this rich basin of the Chippewa Valley. Shallow waterways along the Chippewa River made this area extraordinarily productive for wild rice harvesting. This region offered a habitat rich in sustenance. Around 1800, the area's first trading post was established at the bend of the West Fork of the Chippewa River. This village simply took up the name Post. The native residents referred to it as Pakwewong. It meant where the river is wide. Throughout the first half of the 1800s, many treaties were entered into between the U.S. government and the Chippewa Indians. A treaty is defined as an agreement or contract between two sovereign and independent nations. The U.S. government recognized then, as it does today, that Indian nations were independent and that they maintained the same sovereignty as other nations. Through treaties, the Ojibwe ceded vast areas of land to the U.S. government. The most significant treaty occurred in 1854. The Treaty of La Pointe established the specific rights of the Lacoudere Band of Lake Superior Indians and defined the reservation as it is today. Although the land was traded, it is important to emphasize that the Indians never sold their rights to hunt, fish, and gather in these ceded territories. These rights were retained. We, our reservation is a weird shape. Most reservations you'll see are square, so many thousands of acres. Well, ours, Chief Akawenzi, he was our head chief at the time. He recognized the importance of our wild rice crop to our people. It was basically our whole economy. 25,000 pounds a year would come off that river for our people. And you could live off that alone. It was higher in vitamins, zinc, ribble, flavin, all those things than corn, oats, rice, wheat. And uh, so he walked that whole river wild rice crop and with the BIA guy, or be the BIA predecessor, whatever that was, and, and incorporated all that wild rice crop into our reservation, and that's why our reservation is such a weird shape. And of course, you know the story, what happened after that, the federal government condemned our land and put in a, a, a dam and flooded out that wild rice crop. But, that's why our reservation's here today. It's a reserve, we reserved so many thousand acres within our homeland so that we would have permanent homes forever here. I was uh, on the radio talking about uh, spear season coming up, spear fishing, and they asked if I would take a few calls. I said, sure. One of the callers called in from uh, Milwaukee area and said, uh, you lost the war, Indian. How can you call yourself a nation? when you lost the war. And I explained to him, just like I explained to the fourth and fifth graders out in our school, what, what happened. I said, remember when you first became a country? Who was your first president? George Washington. The very first powers that George Washington got from his Congress were, and from the people were to negotiate with other nations. England, France, Iroquois, Chippewa. And that's the beginning basis for, for the, why we have the sovereign nation status today. It was a government-to-government -government negotiations between the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa people, and the United States government. We didn't have a war. We didn't lose any war, you know. We negotiated, made a treaty, which the Constitution says is the supreme law of the land, just like a treaty you make with England over the Revolutionary War, 
Treaty of Paris, and that is the, the main basis why we are still a nation today. You cannot make a treaty with a local town government. It's a nation-to-nation -nation agreement. And we made that agreement. Our chief signed a treaty with the federal government. For a period of time, shortly after the Treaty of 1854, the U.S. government took away all the Lacoudere lands, leaving them with no reservation at all. When it was returned to them 13 years later, non-native individuals had purchased much of its prime river and lake frontage property. The period of treaties had come to an end when in 1887, Congress passed the General Allotment Act. The Allotment Act divided reservation lands into parcels or homesteads. This act was destined to work against Native Americans from the start. Land speculators and large lumber companies were easily able to take advantage of the Native Americans' lack of ability to pay certain disputable local taxes. The reservation became a patchwork of land parcels, with non-Indians owning vast quantities of property. Clear-cut policies of the lumber companies reduced giant forests to barren landscapes, removing not only the obvious resources that were used to make canoes, dwellings, and baskets, the changed environment meant game would no longer be available in adequate measure. The impact on the lives of the inhabitants of Pakwewong or Old Post by the creation of the Chippewa flowage cannot be measured. For years, the majority of the village's residents fought a determined battle against the Wisconsin, Minnesota Light and Power Company, who desired to utilize the resource for generating electricity. The dam would also help to control flooding that resulted in large part from the extensive damming already put in place by logging companies along the Chippewa River system. The dam would create a massive flowage, creating Wisconsin's third largest lake. Because the power company had huge capital reserves, and since much of the land had been parceled up as a result of the General Allotment Act, large tracts of land were easily acquired. After years of legal challenges to preserve their homeland, the small village lost its fight to the power company. In all, 5,600 acres of fertile reservation land were flooded. Lost were the vast groves of maple trees necessary for making maple sugar. The once abundant cranberry bogs were destroyed. The principal Ojibwe staple and most culturally significant resource, wild rice, was entirely wiped out. The most disturbing aspect for the long established people of Post, however, was the loss of their ancestral home. As many as 700 or more Indian graves were left behind. As the bottom soil began to loosen, bones washed ashore and caskets floated to the surface. Some of the emptied grave sites can still be seen today in the flowage. That's a story in itself, how people felt, especially when they, you know, uh, uh, with their, our ancestors underneath the water like that, and they were supposed to have taken all them out and they only took a few and decided they wouldn't take any more and, and just left uh, a whole bunch of them. And there was, like I say, it was where all our, our uh, family. The power company constructed a new post, which is located near Pakagama Lake. Unfortunately, for the traditional residents of the flowage, growing wild rice became impossible after the construction of the dam because the water levels were now annually adjusted. Successful harvesting of wild rice requires very consistent water levels. In 1934, the Indian Reorganization Act finally brought about an admission of injustice by the U.S. government that was built into the General Allotment Act. This legislation attempted to replace allotment and assimilation policy with greater acceptance of Native cultures and support for economic self-sufficiency and self-government. Our current form of government came to be out of the uh, Indian Reorganization Act, 1934. And uh, here at LCO, we didn't sign the, the IRA Constitution until 1966. Uh, the, the Indian Reorganization Act constitutions were 
basically a fill in the blanks type of constitution. I blank, you fill in your tribe's name, you know that, and then fill in the blanks with all your tribe's name, and that's a constitution that that we're under. It's a BIA uh, prototype, which sets up the seven-member council, the duties and the powers of the council, and and uh, how elections are run, how new members are are taken into the tribe. Before that, we had uh, heads of families, heads of clans that, that uh, were kind of like the representatives in a government. Uh, we had chiefs, uh, different chiefs for different things. Obviously, we had a wild rice chief. He would go check the rice and determine when the rice was available to harvest, when it was ripe. We had war chiefs that they were the ones that had the experience in, in war fighting and decided when it was right to go to war, when it was wrong, when it was negotiations time. And uh, that's the way we kind of ran then. Actually, the American government is based on our form of government, a confederacy. We had a three fires confederacy. Iroquois had the five uh, tribe confederacy. And, and I always say, you know, that they, all they knew were kings, dictators, and czars when they came over here. So that, there's a lot of difference between then and now in our form of government. But if you look a little deeper, the people that are elected to council generally have big, large families, very big families, the Isham family, Corbine, Carly, Trepania. So in a way, the council members still are kind of the heads of the families, heads of the clans. And in a way, we still have some of that. But now we have last names, not clan symbols. The decade of the 1970s was an unsettled time on the Lakutere Reservation. In the summer of 1971, the tribe seized and took control of the Winter Dam from the Northern States Power Company in an attempt to secure control of the reservoir. Although negotiations ended in compromise, the Winter Dam takeover instilled a heightened sense of solidarity for Native Americans, especially for the Ojibwe tribes in the region. In the spring of 1974, winds of change were drifting across the reservation. State wardens arrested two brothers, Lakutere tribal members, for spearfishing off their reservation. The tribe filed suit against the DNR, arguing that they were being deprived of their rights to spear in the ceded territory. After years of review, in what is known as the Voight case, the United States Court of Appeals reaffirmed the rights for Chippewa to hunt fish and gather on their ceded lands. The court proceedings that ensued are too numerous to go into sufficient detail here. It's safe to say, however, that this incident provided tremendous significance and consideration to the issues of Native American sovereignty and self-determination. The year following the Spearing incident, in the fall of 1975, winds were also blowing just to the north and west of La Couture in Hayward at the public high school. In 1975, there was no LCO tribal school system and children from the reservation had to travel to Hayward. The walkout story is well known in the Lakutere schools. That's because without the bravery of one frightened girl, the Lakutere school might not be here at all. A young Becky Taylor had endured more than her share of bigotry and decided to take matters into her own hands. I didn't know what the word prejudice was until I felt it. The examples of um, a non-caring environment that uh, we represented probably about 40% of the, the Hayward school system, the public school system at that time. From feeling like I was like a lazy, coming from a drunken family, to um, being stupid, you know? That was the kind of um, picture that I had of myself because that's the picture that they had of me. And, and the, the real facts was I came from a sober environment. I came from a good family. You notice in all the classrooms, that's the way it was. All the Indian kids sitting in the back, back, back um, of the class and, and, and to be called upon 
um, for a question that you couldn't answer because you didn't have the book, you know, to prepare yourself for the homework. And the prejudice through, um, through the hallways, it just, you know, from the, to even through the bathrooms, um, um, the discrimination of um, colonists, Indian women squaws, you know, that's a very, very derogatory word. Becky walked out of the school and never really looked back. She did, however, look to the future. With the support of parents, a progressive-minded tribal council, and an enterprising group of students, groundwork was set in place for the creation of the Lakutare school system. The Lakutare Ojibwe School is a tribally controlled grant school funded through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and receives no funding from state tax revenues. The Lakutare Ojibwe Community College provides opportunities for individual self-improvement in a rapidly changing technological world while maintaining the cultural integrity of the Anishinaabe. To see this, you know, is, is um, I feel honored, you know, to hear the buses behind me, you know, walk through the classrooms again, see my first first teacher here, and she's still here, and that's really encouraging. It's a beautiful curriculum here. It's based on um, our values of, and traditions of um, having the traditional four seasons of the camps that are here in this community. We have um, arts and crafts being done. They're, they're working on their dance regalia for the Powells that are coming up to this area. Um, you can hear the vibes in the hallways and, and it's just like that same spirit that I felt when I was in high school. Um, that spirit's back here again. After four years in college, after I get out of high school, I get my bachelor's degree and I want to run for a tribal, tribal um, chairman of LCO. And then after my term is up then I wanted to go and run for the president of the United States. And it's important to me like that, like I said before, is so that more youth that are younger than me know that they can do something with their life if they put their mind to it. Justin is an example of the new generation of Lakutare Ojibwe. He's a youth worker with the Boys and Girls Club of Lakutare. The Boys and Girls Club, which is exceptionally active on the reservation, offers programs that are designed to impact the lives of youth on the reservation and direct them away from drugs and alcohol abuse as well as criminal activity. When I was a young kid, I always wanted to be chairman. And I think all young kids, girls, boys, should want to be chairman. But now that I know all the work that's entailed, and uh, I think I like being vice chairman, and uh, if I spend a few more years on the tribal council and get some more experience and uh, become an elder, then I wouldn't mind being chairman. But that sure is a heck of a lot of work. So. A deep-rooted belief for most Native American people is the seven-generation principle. This principle is certainly alive and well on the Lakutare Reservation. Decisions are made with their effects on the next seven generations in mind. This way of thinking, along with a culture that is steeped in storytelling, lends to development of a profound degree of respect for one's elders. I feel that it's important because I know the Ojibwe language and Ojibwe culture is getting lost because of our lack of communication between the youth and the elders, and the elders hold that information that, need, that needs to be taught to the youth. And um, I just feel that the culture is really important to me because if I know if I'm older, I'd like to pass it on to some of the youth so our culture isn't lost. Uh, that was the way I was brought up, and that's the way our, all of our ancestors back, uh, probably four to five generations that we've, uh, we can really look at. And that's the way they were taught to, you know, to, to, to sit down. We had to listen to stories. We had to listen when the elder was talking because the elder was the person that, that meant your survival. I mean, they, they, have, they had to do that. And that's the way I want my grandchildren right now to, to learn. And that's why they're, they're with me any place that I go. 
if they're not invited uh, along with me, I don't use the uh, 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 do things uh, because I want them to know what, what is happening. And, and, and that's how we can send messages to, you know, to people. That's what's wrong with the world today, I think, is because they're, they're, they're just not learning enough about themselves and their lands and their culture. There was a period of time that began just about the time that the oldest surviving elders can remember to today's generation, when Ojibwe people were forbidden to practice any of their customs. Children were actually punished if they were caught speaking their native language. It is an unbelievably small thread that holds the line of Ojibwe heritage. Ojibwe children at Lakutare today are once again learning the traditional ways of their ancestors. Students are learning about harvesting and gathering with the help of concerned teachers who want to make certain these traditions are not lost forever. In some cases, children are learning customs that were lost to their families so that now they can teach their parents what they never learned. Schools are offering classes to older students to learn traditional arts and crafts. A resurgence of Ojibwe traditions can be seen flourishing throughout the reservation. Knowledge of nutrition and therapeutic values of plants, berries, and herbs is once again being shared and practiced by many on the reservation. Traditions like storytelling, the recognition of the extended family, and the importance of humor are still as vital to the Ojibwe people as ever. Concerned traditionalists are showing a new generation how to survive in a world without today's modern amenities. Maple sugar boiling, trapping, and birch bark peeling demonstrate how life can be lived and enjoyed when you live in harmony with nature. We also go into the schools and, and speak to them on traditional hunting and on sharing, and uh, they're taught how to harvest an animal correctly. This is the 21st century, and it is a good time to be Native American. Tribal gaming has brought about significant changes to the Lakutare Reservation. Revenues from the casino help fund tribal government operations and programs, provide for the general welfare of the tribe and its members, and significantly promote tribal development. Employment, standards of living, education, community services, and even entrepreneurship have benefited considerably from Indian gaming revenues. The Community Health Center and the LCO Fire Department are examples of improvements that have been made possible from the revenues provided through Indian gaming. The LCO Casino, Lodge, and Convention Center is an impressive facility that has proved to be a tremendous boon to the local economy. The tribe has become the largest employer in Sawyer County. Our population is increasing dramatically now that we have an economy uh, like the casino uh, employment more people are coming back to the reservation. With, and before, people were all leaving the reservation to get jobs. Now they're coming back, so obviously we need more housing, we need uh, more parks, we need more uh, jobs, and everything. Uh, water and sewer, we can't scrape out a square and put a house there and have a septic tank there because we only have 76,000 acres left. We can't pick up and move if it's polluted. So we have to really plan for the future, which means infrastructure, water and sewer, the newest technology, you know, uh, possibly photovoltaics on our uh, houses. I heard one uh, woman say my, her dream house was a solar-powered wigwam, you know, and hey, you know, it's, we have to think for the future here. And, uh, so. It's going to be tough, but I'm hanging in there, and hopefully with Justin there coming up to take my job, I think all kids like him should want to be chairman and president. A representation of the growing economy and business climate on the reservation is a new facility that serves as the LCO Tourist Information Center, LCO Federal Credit Union, and Entrepreneurial Incubation Center. A lot of the um, economic transactions of our overall society uh, is electronic and uh, most of our tribal members won't, do not have a computer and, and the ability to 
do these transactions at home and they can come to the uh, credit union and they will do their um, banking for them and do their and they could even do the um, their taxes have them sent here hopefully within this next year the tourism information center is a great resource for finding out about La Couture Ray history or to learn about the many other enjoyable activities that can be enjoyed in the area. You know, we have our casino hotel um, that has all the amenities in their hot tub um, exercise room. And from there, we have um, Herman's Landing Resort that's out on the flowage. Herman's Landing is uh, one of the oldest established resorts on the flowage. History goes way back into the early 1930s. Now we've developed into a, a full-service resort with the Coudere Tribe purchased Herman's Landing in March of 1999. And we have fishing guides out there that'll take you out to catch the big one. Our college, we're building a um, living cultural center. And that is going to be really an attraction to anybody that wants to come, you know, to LCO. Um, the tours, you could come into the tourism office and I could take you on tours to where all the historical markers are and information on the Winter Dam. There's campgrounds, we've got RV parks, and a lot of swimming, you know. Snowmobiling, if you want to come up in the wintertime, you know, there's so much snowmobiling. The paths are um, well-groomed, well taken care of. And I believe they're starting ATV um, paths, you know, throughout the reservation too. Hiking, biking, and primitive island camping are other activities offered in the flowage. New additions, currently under construction, include an arts and crafts center, historical village with an RV park and nature trails, and new powwow grounds. Visitors can enjoy traditional Native American music, dancing, crafts, and foods on the third weekend of July, when the Lakota Ray Reservation hosts North America's largest traditional powwow, the Honor the Earth powwow which commemorates the winter dam occupation and gives thanks for the Earth's harvest. Veterans are honored with a feast and powwow celebration on November 11th of each year. Native Americans have traditionally had a higher than average percentage of people serving in the armed forces. A shift to new business development is being born on the reservation. In the same building that houses the tourism center and the LCO credit union, is the new incubation center. Well, the new incubation center is, is one of those things that's being progressive in our business community. We haven't had commercial property before for businesses to rent, and so it's opened a whole new opportunity for uh, you know, businesses to be in there to foster those, those businesses and help them grow. And hopefully uh, the idea would be to move in the incubation building, get outgrow that building and move somewhere else and have another small business move in. More and more examples of the community's progressive approach to the future are becoming evident throughout the Lakota Ray Reservation. One example is its Woodland Community Public Radio Station, 88.9 WOJB. Licensed to the tribe, the 100,000 watt radio station addresses issues from a national, regional, and local perspective. A major goal of WOJB is to sustain and progress the living culture of the Lakota Ray people. Its desired objective from the start has been to improve communication between Indian and non-Indian communities of northern Wisconsin. That's probably one of the greatest things about this station is we're not stuck to any format. It's generally when you're working the air, it's kind of you, you select the music that you think you want to put through. Um, you do, we do have program formats that, that we try to fill in, that we present, the radio station tries to present, and we'll try and fill those, such as the one I'm doing tonight is World Beat and Reggae, and um, some of the others, um, they run a big top Chautauqua show and uh, Blues Monday. Um, we have different programs we'll fill. WOJB is listener supported and is heavily dependent on its many volunteers who contribute their efforts to maintain the distinction of being one of Wisconsin's truly outstanding broadcast resources. Our website is uh, www.wojb.org. Um, 
We have a web page and you can pull that up and listen to us over your computer. And a number of people who live out of the area, um, away from this area, who can't receive it over a regular radio will oftentimes pull it up on their computer while they're working on their computer or just to listen to the radio station because of the variety of music and the information that we present. The tribe has numerous enterprises and indications are that commercial growth as a trend will continue. The tribal administration building houses the tribal government, Head Start, and social services departments. The tribe also owns and operates VLCO Commercial Center, specialty stores and restaurants, Cranberry Marsh, Forest Products, Quick Stop Gas Station, and a variety of other businesses and services. Well, I think that the times are really exciting here for the kids because there's new programs going on. You know, we have uh, the LCO Community College, excellent school, and it's right here. And also we have a new uh, Native American high-tech apprenticeship program that's just being implemented. You know, we have contracts with NASA, uh, contracts with Lockheed Martin, um, doing the highest tech um, machining and computer work. Uh, and those things are real exciting because we never had that before. Those provide a very good um, future. You know, we just had a we just had a Native American astronaut go up into space this last week. I mean, there's just exciting things going on for the for the young kids to be involved in as far as school wise. You know, the best thing they can do is get as much education as they possibly can. There's a slight mixture of old time traditions with uh, 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 a mixture of uh, modern technology. Uh, I, you know, I come back to the highly adaptable people thing. We are not living in teepees like a senator asked me when I was up testifying before Congress. He stopped me right in the middle of my speech and said, do you guys still live in teepees? Because these guys were from out east. And Well, first of all, we never lived in teepees. We lived in wigwams here. But uh, that's the, you know, the common theme out there. No, we're modern. We didn't stop in time at the treaties, just like the United States didn't stop in time. They're not in buggies and horses anymore. We adapted and endeavor to persevere, like Chief Dan George always says. And so life on the reservation is that. We got, uh, we'll have a car, but we'll have the eagle feather hanging on the car. Maybe we'll have the palm print on the car, just like, and then we'll have them call it our pony. My truck I call my hunting pony. I mean, that is the modern pony. It has a 150 horses in the engine instead of just one, but, but that's kind of how it's like. It's a mixture of the old traditions to bridge the gap to the modern technological society. And I want the kids to know that it's okay to pick up the computer. It's okay to, to pick up the synthesizer. You know, take the tools of the new future and remember the traditions of the past and who you are and bridge that gap and move forward. The land of the Lakota Ray has changed considerably since the arrival of its original inhabitants. The pride of the Ojibwe is becoming more apparent. A big reason for that is because seven generations ago, chiefs and other tribal leaders made sure that this land would survive to nurture its people. The people of the Lakota Ray tribe extend a hand of welcome to all non-native visitors and hope that understanding and mutual respect can result from the lessons learned at the place where the river is wide. Miigwech.